Hello, my name is Professor Matthew Cobb from the University of Manchester, and I'm going to be talking about what makes great biology. Now, this was a talk that I gave last week to our School of Biological Sciences symposium, and we intended to have it recorded live. Unfortunately, there was a glitch, so we're now recording it again in this rather more intimate fashion. Now, the reason why I'm talking about what makes great biology is not because I think any of what I've done is particularly great, but over the last year or so, I've been thinking a lot about that, partly because of some work I've been doing at Cold Spring Harbor in the United States and around the world, in fact, thinking about how two of the 20th century's great scientists, Sidney Brenner and Francis Crick, interacted. So I thought I'd give my audience, and now you, the benefit of some of my ideas. Some of these are quite ordinary, some of them might be provocative, but I hope you'll be interested. The first question is, what is great? How do we define it? This is my definition, yours might be different, but I think it includes first any research, any discovery that influences our thinking about life along the whole scale, from nucleic acids right up to ecosystems. And it's got to have a long-lasting effect. It's got to be something that really changes the field and opens, in fact, new ways of thinking about the topic and, with a bit of luck, other topics as well. I don't think it has to include either large grant funding, publication in a high-ranking sexy journal, or indeed a practical or therapeutic implication. Now, my views about that last point, those last three points, will differ probably from those of university administrators, uh, grant awarding bodies, and so on. But I think they probably concord with what most practicing scientists think. Now, I think there are five components which you need to combine uh, to get the best effect. First, you need to get involved in the early game, thinking about how a particular idea or method can change what is going to come. You need to be involved in the long game. You need to think about research in long-term perspectives. This is often difficult because research councils in particular uh, tend to think that research can be done in three years and that's it. Uh, that's the, last, the duration of a, uh, a grant normally. But I think we need to think about research that can have long-term implications because it's got long-term studies. You need to think about developing the right tools for the job, the right way of discovering a particular area that you're interested in exploring it. And finally, you need to find the right team, the right group of people who can work together in a complementary way. And I'm going to go through each of those examples and explore some of the interesting case studies that make us think about how we can use these four ideas, these four components. Now, I said at the beginning there were five components. I've only given four here. And that's because the fifth one, the most intangible one, is probably what decides whether, even if you have these four components, you're still able to do great biology. And I'll come on to the fifth component at the end. So, to start with, the early game. And in each of these cases, each of these four components, I'm going to give a couple of examples. And we're going to start off with a picture quiz, uh, a portrait or an image, your starter for 10, and you've got to work out who that person is. Uh, when we did the lecture, we had people shouting out. When they knew the answer, you'll just have to shout at the screen. OK, so who's this chap here? Well, if you don't know, this is Sidney Brenner. Uh, Sidney Brenner, one of the 20th century's great biologists. And Brenner is a brilliant example of the early game. Brenner was a student at Oxford in 1953, when he was invited in April to go to Cambridge to see the double helix model that Watson and Crick had created. He was just a postgraduate student and he was interested in how you could study molecules and use that way of understanding them to understand biological processes. So he was taken along with Dorothy Hodgkins and others to see the double helix model. And as soon as he saw it, he realized that this would be extremely significant. And he realized that this is what he wanted to work on. And he began plotting his move from Oxford to Cambridge, which he was eventually able to achieve uh, in three years later. 
So you might think this is fairly obvious. Everybody who saw the double helix molecule realized its significance, but that's not actually true. Indeed, many people at this time were still not convinced that DNA was the genetical material. Right up until the early 1960s, there were many people who were still suggesting, well, maybe genes are made out of proteins or some protein DNA mixture. Brenner, however, not only realized the significance of the structure of DNA, but he wanted to then work on understand how it actually functioned. Now, even more extraordinarily, having had a, a view of the early game right at the very beginning, within 10 years, as the genetic code was being unraveled, he, along with Francis Crick and many other, of the other pioneers of molecular genetics, realized that, as they put it, it's all over. We've discovered all of the key things we need to find out about how the double helix works, and it's going to be time to move on. There's going to be nothing major to discover from now on. So Brenner then began to work on the idea of trying to understand how organisms develop, and he suggested that researchers should move to study a tiny worm called C. elegans. And indeed, he then created a second early game by pioneering this research. Right, here's another picture. Who's this chap? Probably not going to know who it is, which is a great shame, but I predict you will eventually know who he is. Uh, this is Francisco Mojica, and he's from Alicante. And without his work, some of the most exciting science being done at the moment would not be being done, because we wouldn't know about it. In 1993, he was a 20-year-old PhD student, and he was studying uh, what are called halophilic archaea. These are bacteria that like living in very salty lakes. That's why he's sitting next to a salt lake in this picture, uh, which is not far from his university. And he noticed, as he was studying the DNA sequences of these bacteria, that they had these strange 30 base pair sequences that were repeated. And he became very intrigued by this. And eventually, he was able to show that these were not only just an odd feature of this particular kind of archaea, but they were found in all sorts of bacteria. And this is what was known as CRISPR. In fact, it's him who uh, coined this acronym of CRISPR, which is a way now used as a way of manipulating genes in all sorts of organisms. This is one of the most exciting fields of biology and medicine. But Mojica, when he did this research, was finding it a hard to actually get published. So in his key paper, in which he showed that uh, CRISPR in bacteria acts as an immune system, he submitted it to Nature. It got rejected without review. He then submitted it to PNAS. It similarly got rejected. Microbiology to nucleic acid research. All these major journals weren't interested in the paper. Eventually, he got it published in the Journal of Molecular Evolution, where it has since been cited 545 times in the last 12 years. So Mahika is an example of somebody who realized that something was important, was obsessive about it, and carried on pioneering that research. And I, for one, hope that when eventually the Nobel Prizes are given for CRISPR, as they will be inevitably, that Mahika, the man who pioneered this area, doesn't get forgotten. Right, what about this person? Who's this? No? This is Georgina Mace from the University College of London. And she was a PhD student uh, in the 1980s and was studying uh, primates, doing some very interesting research, but it wasn't having a major change on how we understand the world. Her big breakthrough came in 1991, where she realized that you could use mathematics to actually model very interesting biological problems, such as extinction risk. So together with the IUCN, which is the main body that studies the uh, risk of extinction in the world and has a list of uh, endangered species, she came up with a method for trying to use research to then quantify extinction risk. And this 1991 paper has since been cited 476 times. And this really created a whole new area of research. She then went on uh, to model trends in biodiversity, that is to study one of the most important issues on the planet, the patterns of uh, extinction and biodiversity that we can see around us and which are being changed using these mathematical models. So she realized that 
both mathematics and the, the existence of large data sets, in particular through journal data sets, would enable her to actually explore this very interesting area of conservation biology. And in 2000, she came up with a, uh, a way of trying to work out to predict what would lead to uh, extinction. And this paper has been cited nearly 700 times. And the answer that she came up with uh, might be seen quite intuitive to uh, conservation biologists. But nonetheless, she was able to give it that intuition and numerical and factual underpinning. Uh, and what she argued is that it effectively it's low density, slow life history, and a small geographical range. If you've got all those three, then you're much more likely to go extinct if you're a species uh, than in other circumstances. So we've had the early game, people realizing how a research area is going to move and carrying out pioneering research and changing their field in that way. What about the long game? What about long-term research? So who's this? Uh, I'm talking about the, the, the chap on the, the right in the image, um, the bloke with the beard. No? Uh, this is Richard Lensky from Michigan State. And in 1998, Professor Lensky asked a very simple question. What actually happens genetically to a species over time? How does it change in evolutionary terms? And he set up what he's called the long-term evolution experiment, which involved initially 12 identical lines of E. coli bacteria, which he simply replated onto these plates you can see in these towers in the image, and just waited to see what happened. Now, this has since uh, gone through nearly 69,000 generations of bacteria, Bacterial generation time is about 6.6 .6 hours. So you can see this is a massive data set. And what we now know is all those lines have now diverged. They're all genetically different. And in one particular line, they have since acquired a major mutation, completely spontaneously, that enables them to live on the citrate that is present in the food. Most of the, uh, the other 11 lines and all the other known uh, strains of E. coli can't survive on that, but this particular mutated line has now gone off in a completely different direction. So this work has led to over 50 articles. It's employed dozens of postdocs and postgraduate researchers and has had over 14,000 citations, all for the pathetic amount of 130,000 per year. I mean, this is incredible value for money. Any research council thinking about the value of long-term research can see that the input, the financial input that uh, Professor Lensky's had and the output he's had in terms of the people he's trained and the impact his research has had, this long-term study has been extraordinary. And this is only something that you could answer this question, what actually happens? Can we observe evolutionary change? This is only something you can find out by actually doing the experiment. Next long-term example, uh, is not actually, a, this isn't a picture of a, a person, this is a picture of some insects. So this time uh, the question is, how many insect orders can you see in this picture? I've been able to spot three. And the ones I can spot are Diptera, loads of flies, uh, Hymenoptera, so there's some wasps in there and a honeybee, I think. And there's one Mecopteran, or scorpion fly, down at the bottom. Now, this is an image from a paper that was published just last year by a group of Dutch, German, and UK entomologists. And it is dealing with one of the most significant ecological events of our lifetime. That is the change in the biodiversity of insects in industrialized countries. This is based on 27 years of largely amateur collection data from 63 sites in Germany. And it was able to reveal that over that period, there had been a decline of 82% in the summer flying insect biomass. And this is absolutely catastrophic. It concords with most people's impressions. There seem to be fewer insects around than there were in the past. But this long-term study carried out largely by amateurs was able to actually put a number on that and sound the alarm. It seems that, well, they were unable to uh, explain this decline either in terms of the climate change, land use, habitat, none of them seem to explain it. It seems almost certainly that it's going to be the effect of the pesticides that we're using to increase food production is having an unexpected knock-on effect on these insects, 
which are the major pollinators. The main pollinator of plants are not, uh, as you might expect, bees. They are, in fact, flies. And all those flies that you can see in that picture are showing a catastrophic decline thanks to human activity. Next, the right tools for the job, finding the right way of studying what you're interested in. So, who's this person? Well, this is Eve Marder from Brandeis University. And uh, Professor Mar Marder has been studying the lobster stomatogastric ganglion. Now, most of you will probably think, why on earth would anybody want to spend their life studying how a lobster's stomach actually works? Because that effectively is what she's been devoted her life to looking at. And in fact, this is a model system. This is an ideal system for understanding how neuronal networks work. There are, in this stomatogastric system, there are 30 neurons, a set of neuromodulators, so both uh, neurotransmitters and other substances that alter the activity of those neurons. And this is as far as we can get at the moment to understanding how a neural circuit works. Indeed, we still don't fully understand it. So even how a lobster's stomach works, we don't understand. So trying to understand how the human brain works, we're way off that. But Professor Marder and her group of researchers and colleagues around the world have made enormous progress in understanding a basic principle. How does a neural network work by studying something which might seem to be rather odd, that is, a lobster stomach? This has led to 13,000 citations, and in 2016, Professor Marder won the Kavli Prize, which many people think is the a kind of precursor to getting the Nobel, and it seems very likely that, indeed, she will eventually win that prize. OK, so who's this uh, rather dapper chap in the mountains? Well, this man, I think, is probably one of the most important biologists on the face of the planet at the moment. Uh, his name is Svante Perbo, and he's from the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig. And Svante has really changed our view of what it is to be human, I think, which is why I'm so much in love with him and his research. Uh, he became obsessed with the idea in the late 1980s of trying to extract DNA from Egyptian mummies. And as a result of this, he's pioneered what is called ancient DNA. Now, his early research on mummies turned out to be largely wrong. It was basically the things he was able to extract was to do with contamination. And after those false starts, he realized he needed to develop the right tools, the right technology to extract very small traces of DNA from ancient remains. And in 2010, he was actually able to sequence the whole genome of a Neanderthal, that is, our very close relative. Indeed, what his research revealed was that this close relative was much closer than anybody ever imagined, that in fact, we have exchanged genes long in the past with the Neanderthals and vice versa. This work has led to 1,300 citations and has really changed everything. We now have a completely different view of the Neanderthals and of their significance in our particular journey. Indeed, overall, his work on ancient DNA has led to over 26,000 citation. So an extraordinary impact, but was only possible because he was able to overcome, together with his colleagues, some incredible technological uh, obstacles, great difficulties of having contamination from modern sources, and of being able to extricate tiny pieces of DNA and then stitch them together using computers to come up with the whole sequence. Now, the final uh, aspect of what I think makes great biology, I'm going to give you examples, is teamwork. So we're going to start off uh, with this. What's this? Well, you can probably see, if you look at the credit in the bottom right, uh, that might help you. This was a blackboard that was used every day by two people, and they used it in this rather unprepossessing building in Cambridge, which was known as the Hut, uh, and was part of the MRC's generous funding of their research. And as, as you've probably guessed, the two people were Francis Crick and Sidney Brenner, who the people whose work I've been studying. And every day, they shared an office, so every day they would scribble on this blackboard their ideas, their, I, their thoughts, their suggestions for experimentation. 
And the things they were able to kind of brainstorm on that blackboard through their collaboration are quite remarkable. Together they came up with the idea of the central dogma, one of the fundamental ideas of molecular genetics. They worked out how messenger RNA must work and devised an experiment to be able to test it. They came up with the triplet nature of the genetic code, one of the basic features of molecular genetics. And indeed, they again, they worked out how to test that idea. They came up with what Crick called the wobble hypothesis, which is how amino acids are strung together and uh, recognized by the cellular machinery. And they also decoded the final codon in the genetic code in 1967. And then finally, on those blackboards, they came up with the idea that, in fact, molecular biology had come to some kind of end in 1963, and therefore they needed to go on and study new areas of biology, developmental biology in the case of uh, Brenner, and ultimately neuroscience and consciousness in the case of Francis Crick. So how did they actually do this work? How did they make these great leaps forward? What did their collaboration and this mad scribbling on the blackboard consist of? According to their own accounts, first they asked each other penetrating questions. They obsessively discussed literature, even what they thought were useless papers, because as they put it, there might be a clue in it, there might be some way of understanding things that they could get an insight into. They had to have a willingness to argue and to be wrong about a particular idea. Uh, and as they said, there was never an angry word between us, so they actually got on with each other remarkably well and could say something stupid and the other person wouldn't get angry. And they above all had complementary approaches and skills. Brenner was uh, not only very, very smart, but also was a great experimentalist. Crick had a mind that could think in the most abstract way possible, though he wasn't necessarily very good in the laboratory. Uh, here's a picture of them, and we can listen to them in their own words, saying how they actually carried out this research. We did share an office for whatever it was, 20 odd years, but he was often in the lab, but then he'd come in and then he'd tell me what he'd been doing or I'd raise something I'd been reading and we'd just chat away. And the one thing that we did have was a rule that you could say anything that would come into your head. Now, most of these conversations were just complete nonsense. But every now and then we did this because a half-formed idea could be taken up by the other one and, and really refined. Of course, you have to be candid, which is perhaps the, the most important thing. So you can say something which sounds rather aggressive, but the other person knows that's just the way that you usually disagree with him. You see? And you, so if you say, oh, that's all nonsense, uh, it doesn't turn a hair. And you must, of course, try and attack the other person's ideas because it's getting rid of the... Uh, false ideas, which is the most important thing in developing the good ones, and that's what the collaboration is most useful for. I think a lot of the good ideas and a lot of the good things that we produced were produced in these, in these completely mad sessions. Clearly these two people were very, very smart and quite extraordinary. Are there any lessons there that we can draw for today? Are there any policy, career implications that we can think of and institutions should be encouraging young researchers to emulate. Can it be fostered or was it just magic the way that they happen to interact with each other? Are we in fact simply saying you need to find a clever friend and things will go well? Um, could it in fact exist in today's world? Because clearly they were in a very privileged position. They were in at the beginning. There were lots of exciting things to discover and they were also in a privileged position because they were researchers in Cambridge. I asked Sidney Brenner did you ever mark an exam? No, he said. So those of us who have uh, teaching contributions that are perhaps somewhat higher than this might find it a bit difficult to emulate this free-flowing, endless discussion that Crick and Brenner had. Nonetheless, I think that example of collaboration is indeed inspiring and challenging. Now, most of us don't have those kind of collaborations. And in my case, uh, the example I'm going to talk about now is a collaboration with two colleagues, Kara Hoover uh, on the left and Hiro Matsunami on the right. And actually in a very modern collaboration, I've never actually met Hiro, uh, we collaborated by email and by ideas. And 
we were making, uh, carrying out a study on how a particular human olfactory receptor works. And this olfactory receptor detects just one odour, this odour which is called androstenone, which is very, very specific, and there's variation in the human population for it. Some people think it smells quite sweet, me for example. Uh, other people think it smells absolutely disgusting. And we can go from the phenotype to the genotype, so if you think it smells sweet, I can tell you exactly what the structure of your uh, receptor protein is and what the gene that encodes that receptor protein looks like. And similarly, if we look at the receptor protein and the gene that underlies it, we can then make a prediction about how you will respond. And this is, uh, stuff is often sold as a sex pheromone. It allegedly attracts women fast. Indeed, it allegedly attracts men fast. In fact, it doesn't attract either. Um, it attracts pigs. Uh, and this is, in fact, used as a pheromone in the pig industry. It's secreted by the male boar. And what happens is that you, the male boar will then induce, this pheromone will induce the female into heat. So if you're a pig farmer, uh, you spray this stuff up the nose of the sow, you then surprise her with a turkey baster, and a month or two later you have piglets. However, this stuff is extremely interesting because of the variability uh, that there are in the human population. This is a diagram of what the receptor we use to detect this odour looks like, and this is the only one of our 400 or so olfactory receptors that detects androstenone, and androstenone in turn can only be detected by this. And there is variability in the human population uh, for this substance. All this was discovered by Andreas Keller and Leslie Vossall and co-workers in uh, Rockefeller University about 10 years ago. There are two forms that tend to be found in human populations, and you either have uh, an arginine or a tryptophan amino acid on the outside, you can see here on the outside of the cell, or you have a threonine or methionine on the inside of the cell, and these two forms tend to be inherited together. So most of us are either RT or WM. And what's interesting is that these variations in our genotype are transformed into variations in our phenotype in how we respond. So in general, if you have an R and a T, then you tend to think it smells nasty. And if you have an M and a W, you tend to think it smells nice. And we can go from the genotype to the phenotype and vice versa. So if we see somebody with an RT genotype, then we can predict they will think that it smells nasty. And if we see somebody who thinks it smells nasty, we can predict they have an RT genotype. And you'll see that this is produced by single base changes in your DNA. And I think that's absolutely remarkable because when we give this odour to different people, they have different perceptions. Some people think it smells nice, some people think it smells nasty. And ultimately, those different perceptions are due simply to the activity of one class of neuron in our nose. That neuron is responding in a slightly different way to the androstenone that you're sniffing, and there is something about, probably about the way the androstenone is binding with the receptor which is changed depending on the structure of the receptor, which is determined by the amino acids, which is determined by the genes. And that change in perception is simply due to the altered function of the neuron. So our perception, in the end, is literally the firing of a neuron in our nose. Now, together with Kara and Hero, we were interested in trying to understand the variation for this in populations around the world. So we studied about 2,000 indigenous individuals from around the world. These weren't actual individuals. These were cell lines that we were studying. And we were trying to understand the evolution of this gene. And we suggested that it might have a cultural significance because it's related to the consumption of pork. If the male pig is not castrated, then the pork will smell or taste of this stuff. And if you are RT, in your genes, you are unlikely to want to eat this stuff because it smells pretty, it tastes pretty disgusting. So we link this to the domestication of the pig, which is all jolly interesting. Then I had an idea, one of the few really good ideas that I think I've ever had. I wondered, what did this chap think of it? This is a Neanderthal. 
It's purely imaginative reconstruction of what a Neanderthal might have looked like, but it's rather different from the traditional images of Neanderthals being very brutish and stupid. And this is partly because of the insight we've got through Svante Perbo's work that we were able to exchange genes with the Neanderthals. So they were clearly very, very similar to us. The genetic differences between us and Neanderthals were absolutely infinitesimal. There are about 96 differences in amino acids, and that's it. Out of about 20,000 protein encoding genes, there are just about 96 differences between us and a Neanderthal. So I wondered, what did the Neanderthal's OR7D4 gene look like? He must have had one because we could interbreed with them. We were that similar. So we went off and looked. And in fact, it was more, even more exciting than that because as well as identifying the Neanderthal genome, what Svante Perbo had been able to do was to discover a completely unknown part of our human tree. In 2011, he dropped a bombshell on the world by announcing the discovery of what are called the Denisovans. The Denisovans are named after a cave, Denisova Cave in uh, Siberia, and in 2008, this tooth had been discovered. Now, when I look at this tooth, it just looks like a big tooth. But if you're a paleoanthropologist, you know immediately that this tooth is rather odd. It is not a human tooth. It's much, much bigger. Uh, it wasn't initially published. It was dated to about 40,000 years old. So people knew there was something very, very interesting. And Svante Perbo and his colleagues were able to extract DNA from this. Uh, since we found another tooth, a metacarpal, which is a tiny finger bone from a nine-year-old girl, a baby tooth, and that's it. So we know virtually nothing, but we know that these were completely different lineage. These were not humans. These were not Neanderthals. These were an unknown taxonomic group who are called the Denisovans. And in 2011, Svante Perbo published uh, the DNA sequence of these individuals demonstrating not only that they were completely different from us and the Neanderthals, but also that we had exchanged genes with them as well. As you can see on the map, we came out of Africa in the Middle East and in Europe, we exchanged genes with the Neanderthals. And then those of us who moved around eastwards as we went through Tibet, down through Southeast Asia and into Australasia, we exchanged genes with the peoples who lived there who were the Denisovans. And indeed, one of the best examples of uh, natural selection in a human population, which was discovered, I think, in 2008, is the ability of Tibetans to survive at high altitudes because of a particular gene they have that enables them to absorb uh, oxygen better. People were very excited when they discovered this, but now it turns out that, in fact, the Tibetans got that gene from the Denisovans, who'd been living there for about uh, several hundred thousand years. So we can ask not only how did the Neanderthals smell this particular odor, but also how did the Denisovans. So effectively, we're going to use DNA to peer back into the sensory world of long extinct relatives. I think this is absolutely extraordinary. Now, the question is therefore, what did the Neanderthals and the Denisovans think about androsterone? Could they smell it? And what did they smell? Now, the Neanderthals that we looked at were all RT, so they would have hated it. They would have thought it smelled disgusting, smelly man, back alley, urine, feces. These are the kinds of words, words that people use today to describe the smell of androsterone if they don't like it. Now, we then got excited because the Denisovan genome had a novel genetic variant, not present in any human population or any of the Neanderthal genome. So how did this affect what the Denisovans were able to smell? Now, it's at this point that the fifth element that I talked about earlier on comes into play, and that's luck. Very difficult to quantify, but we were there. We have this difference. The question is, does it change how the Denisovans perceive this smell? To find out the answer to that question, Hero and his team had to effectively recreate the Denisovan nose in a cell. What they did was to mutate a human gene such that it carried this particular amino acid variant in uh, position 204, 
A was turned into T, and then they put it into a human cell line and basically poured androsterone over the, over the cell, and there was no difference. As you can see from the curve here, uh, the OR, human OR7D4 shows a particular response. The Denisovan A204T shows a response that is exactly the same. So at that point, before we did the experiment, maybe this paper could have gone to a very high-ranking journal and had a huge impact because we had found something novel about the Denisovans. As it was, this is perceived as less exciting. I still think it's pretty amazing myself. Um, and our article was published in 2015 in Chemical Senses. So <clears throat> to sum up, how can we do great biology? What are the lessons from this? First, be an early adopter. Think about how biology is going to move, how it can change, what, what is happening now that can change what we're going to discover tomorrow. Take the long view. This is very difficult because of funding restrictions, but if you can, think about how your study could not just be finished in three years, but how you can study long-term changes. Because this is particularly important in trying to understand both climatic issues, but also in general evolutionary and ecological considerations, how species, individuals are responding to changes over time. Find the right tool for your job, even if it means studying something very obscure. In my case, it's Drosophila maggots, but in Eve Marder's case, the lobster stomatogastric ganglion, or it might be developing tools that would enable you to answer the question, having a technological aspect to your study. That can be absolutely crucial for making great breakthrough. Work in complementary teams. Find people who can complement your ideas. Discover things in new ways. Challenge your thinking. It's no good having people who simply agree with you or think in the same way. You're not actually going to make progress through your discussions. Find people who can challenge you. Really, in fact, find a clever friend who can challenge you. That's the real asset. That's the great thing that can enable you to think about biology in a new way. And finally, that most intangible but incredibly important thing, be lucky. If you can be lucky, you will have great fortune in the future and it will change the way your research goes. That is very difficult to make luck, but one of the ways you make luck is by being persistent and carrying on and continuing in your research and not giving up because eventually something will come good. So there you are, there are my five ways of doing great biology. You might think there are different ways. You would certainly have different examples you'd want to choose for each of the uh, cases that I've given. But I think that this is a useful starting point for individuals, institutions, thinking about how we can promote great science and great biology. Thank you.